deserve the glory, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 We praise your name. Yes, we lift you up, Lord. We give you praise. You deserve the glory. You deserve the glory, Lord.
Jesus for all you've done. Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done for me. You're so faithful, Lord, faithful to me. Lord, you are faithful, faithful to me. Let's just declare that this morning. You've been faithful. You are faithful, faithful to me. He never leaves nor forsakes us. Let's just give him praise. Thank you, Jesus. You've been faithful. Thank you, Jesus. Always there for me. Always there for me. My God is faithful. Faithful. Provider, provider, 
into the heavens, you are there. If I go to the depths of the earth, you are there. Even there, O oh God, your hand shall hold me and your right hand shall lead me. We serve a mighty God. We serve a mighty God this today that is able to do exceedingly abundantly for us. And all that we need, God is able to provide for us. Kindly bow your heads with me. Our Father in heaven, we bless you, we praise you, and we thank you. We just thank you, O oh God, for the privilege we have to stand in your presence. We thank you, O oh God, for the times that you have provided for us, the times you have healed us, the times that you have strengthened us, the times you have comforted us. And so, Father, we just commit our hearts to you. We commit our eyes, we commit our hands, our feet, our body, soul, and spirit unto you, O oh God. That you will continue to live in us and through us. So that everything that we do will bring glory to you, O oh God. We thank you, O oh Lord, for your mercies towards us. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, O oh Lord, that we can sing and stand in your presence this morning. So, Father, we commit everything unto you, O oh God, and we give you the honor and we give you the praise. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Thank you. Well, it is so good for you to be here today. I welcome you. If you're here for the first time as a guest, I welcome you as well. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us. Next week when you come, you're part of the family of Bram Hill Christian Fellowship. You're no longer a guest. If you're watching via the internet, thank you so much for being part of the family of VCF. We love you dearly. God has something in store for you. And we are all here to receive from God. If you're here today as well, and you wanted to be part of the South Asian service, just go through the door, speak to one of our ushers, and they'll direct you to where the service is taking place right now. And we have a wonderful children's ministry that is going on today. The junior highs, they are with us, and they are serving in various capacities. But the children's ministry and the nursery is open for you today. The security kiosk is also open, waiting to receive your children. And when you sign them in, please pick them up before you go. We're going to take this opportunity and we're going to greet each other and express God's love to each other as we do that. And I'd like you to be deliberate and greet someone you have never greeted before. Thank you so much. You are, you are, you are my daily bread. 
came in this morning, you should have received a package that looks like this. If you want to go ahead and take that out, and if you did not receive one, our ushers would be so happy to serve you this morning. Just raise your hand, and they will get one to you. As well, if you didn't bring a pen with you this morning, they have pens, and they would love to give you one of those as well. You can just indicate again by raising your hands, and they will get that to you. And if you want to take your package, and inside, there's something, and it looks like this. It's called a connection card. If you can go ahead and take that out, and on the front side of it, if you could complete it with as much information as you're comfortable in sharing with us, your name, and if you could just check off, if this is your first time here, we are so glad that you chose to visit with us this morning and spend the next few moments with us. If you would just complete this card following the service, we have a welcome center. It's uh, to your, my right, your left. You can just meet us back there, and we have a small gift for you, um, some coffee and light refreshments. We just would like the opportunity to get to know you a little bit better. And if you are a regular attender, if you could fill the card out as well, if you've changed your information, if you could please indicate that we are getting ready to release our end of year giving statements and we need to have your accurate information so we get it into your hands so that would help us out and you can fill that out this morning and then hold on to your card and we will receive it at the end of service this morning. Well today, I, as the Olympics is just around the corner, I want to share a, a quick testimony or story with you about an Olympic athlete who is a believer and has seen God's faithfulness in her life. Uh, Gabby Douglas uh, from the London uh, Olympics was part of the U.S. gymnastics team, and she was a double gold medalist. And last night I was reading an article on her, and uh, she was talking about as a believer, her mom taught her about God's faithfulness. And as a young person, she's only 18 years old, she learned very young that uh, giving was a part of the life of a believer. And over the years and through sacrifice and many challenges they faced, being a single mom with a, with a daughter and sacrificing to move across the country, they continue to just uh, uh, be challenged by God's word and be obedient in their tithe and in their giving and their offerings. And she was testifying about God's faithfulness that over the years of planting seeds and sowing, she's seen God's faithfulness and the abundance in their family and in their life expand and grow in so many areas. So this morning, I want to encourage and I want to challenge you with the story of Gabby Douglas that years of sowing and years of giving, you will continue to see God's faithfulness in your life. So I encourage you as we plant seeds, we may not see them sprout up right away. But in God's time, they will yield a crop 30, 60, or 100-fold. And the way that she exploded on the scene in the Olympics to win two gold medals and get major endorsements and all these things, uh, they don't uh, you know, put that to just hard work. They put that as they have invited God in the process through giving. So I want to encourage you to do that as well this morning, uh, just to challenge you in our tithes and our offerings, that God is faithful, and the seeds that we plant, you can be rest assured that God will see that grow into a bountiful harvest as we give back into him and see that grow and he will meet the needs in your life. Amen? Just want to give you a couple moments just to prepare your tithes and your offerings today. Uh, we do have a, uh, we have two giving kiosks out in our uh, lobby as well in our foyer. Uh, they are open uh, right now and even after the service for debit and for after, for, for debit and interact. So I want to encourage you to do that after service. They are available for you there. And in your package, you have an offering envelope that you can fill out as well. The team will display for us for a moment and then we'll receive that in, in just a couple seconds. Let's take our offering envelope this morning. 
Father, we just thank you today that you're faithful and we hear the stories and testimonies of others. We can be encouraged today, God, that what we sow, God, that we would see a harvest bountiful. Because we know that your word is true. It shall not return void. And you're not a man that you should lie. So we just thank you that we can rely on your word today. We thank you for each gift, for each giver. God, continue to encourage and strengthen our faith in the area of giving. Let this go forward to, uh, in, to expand your kingdom. We just thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to invite our ushers this morning to receive our tithes and offerings. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to invite you to turn your attention towards the screen. We have a short video clip this morning. Slaughter. He was lead singer of the Grammy award-winning Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir uh, for many years, and we have him coming here. Yeah. Woohoo! Yeah. So it is Friday, February 14th, and Saturday, February 15th, we have Kissing Breakups Goodbye, and the Friday night, we are having a special dessert and cafe night right here featuring Elvin Slaughter. Tickets are on sale this morning. It's $25 a couple or $15 a single. Uh, you can see the booth in the lobby for more information. It is going to be a great weekend together. As well, tonight, we have our Movement Youth and Young Adult Service right here at 630. If you're in high school, college and career, or 20-something, we would love to have you come out. As well, our winter retreat is coming up February 21st to 23rd. There are fundraising forms available, or you can get a registration form. Deposits are due next Sunday, so please visit the booth and lobby following the service. Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames is just a couple of weeks away, and we have been praying and believing God to see many people saved. If you need more tickets for the people that you've been praying for, you can pick those up at either of the kiosks in the lobby. There's one at either end of the lobby, or the ushers will have them on your way out this morning. And finally this morning, our winter semester of life groups are starting uh, in February, you can register on the back of your connection card. They're all listed there. You can just check off which one you'd like to attend in the winter semester. Or if you're looking for more information, there's a booth in the lobby. You can pick up a catalog, uh, talk to someone, and find out where you would best fit. For all your other announcements, you can visit our website um, or ask someone at the Information Center this morning. At this time, we'd like to invite Pastor Randy to come to the platform. Amen. so much. <clears throat> well, bless the Lord. It is a good day today. Is that right? Praise God. You look. Tell your neighbor how nice they look, please. Just say, tell the truth. You look nice. Let faith-filled words come out of your mouth. Praise God. Well, it's the end of another month, and that means we want to celebrate with everyone who've had birthdays and anniversaries during the month of January. So if your birthday is during the month of January, would you stand on your feet, please, wherever you are? Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. If you had a wedding anniversary during the month of January, or it's going to happen in the next couple of days, stand on your feet as well, please, looking for the couples. All right. Praise God. Well, we're excited for you. We want to stretch our faith out towards you. Put your hands out towards these dear ones, and we pray. Father, we join our faith with our friends, our family. We thank you, Lord, that they've been able to celebrate another year to serve the Lord. 
Bless them, we pray. Bless them with your presence throughout this whole year, we ask. And Lord, for every couple as well that celebrated another year married to one another, we pray that you'd bless them, continue to let them have great love for one another that is expressed daily, daily, daily. So Lord, bless these dear ones, we ask now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we also pray for Pastor Steph, who's out ministering in Toronto today. We pray that your anointing would flow through him and impact the lives of many. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Well, lots of uh, great things coming up. Isn't that exciting? That on Valentine's Day, we will have Alvin Slaughter here in a, a concert and also teaching. And so I, I encourage you to tell your friends about that. There are some cards in your folder, I believe, and you can get some extra ones outside to use as invitation. We have put a ticket price on it so just so that we're able to help him as he continues to travel around the world. It's going to be the whole... Uh, this whole room is going to be filled with nice tables and, and decorations like Paris. I'm not sure what that's going to look like, but it'll be nice. And we'll have sweets on the tables as well as the sweets you bring with you. If that was your wife or your husband or, or a friend, a close friend. It's not just for married couples. It's for everyone. And maybe you have a friend that you just want to bring out and, and want to learn more about relationships as well. It is for you. So plan to come. And then just before that, is Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames. How many took tickets? Can I see your hands in the air? Do you know that we have, let me see, we have 2,300 tickets out? That's a lot of tickets. Now, how many still have the tickets in your possession? Come on, tell me the truth. Don't lie. All right. The tickets in your possession will do you no good. So the tickets are there so that you can actually put them in the hands of others. So if you haven't done it this week... That's what the tickets are for. They're not as a souvenir for you to put on your dresser or, or on your mirror. They're for you to put in somebody's hand. How many will put them in a hand today? Not, not, well, today is okay, but this week, only two of you. No, no, everybody needs to put them in someone else's hands so that we can do that. Praise God. Well, this uh, yesterday, in fact, um, Ryan and Salome, Salome had her second baby boy, and just a premature baby, but Isaiah Jaden is doing well. So pray for her, please. Not here yet today. So pro probably next week we'll get to see her, maybe. And pray for Mrs. Motley. She had uh, knee surgery and uh, is recovering well. And we will see her back soon. Grab your Bible, please. I, have a, I believe a, a great message that, that God wants us to share today. Remember... We're talking about being transformed into the image of His dear Son. What scripture verse have we been using over this past month? Romans chapter 12 and verse number 2. Okay, so let me read it for you. As you find it, it just, I just want to make sure it's underlined in your Bible. If you have a paper Bible or highlighted in an electronic one. If you're watching from home over the internet, make sure you get a Bible out so you can record some. Today, I'm going to go to a number of different verses, and so please uh, just mark them down so that you can look at them at home, because I believe God wants to help us. And it says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by, help me out, by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Good to have the junior hires here with us today. We're excited for you. Learn as we're here together. Uh, the Bible is so simple, it helps us to understand it. We never do complex messages here to try to twist our minds that only really high, high thinkers can hear. But God's Word is simple to us, just like Jesus taught it. And so today, I want, to, uh, I want to help you understand a little more about being transformed. We've been talking about being transformed in a, through prayer last week, through outreach and touching the lives of others. And so we're going to talk more about that today and take it a little bit further as well. But, but let me clarify about being transformed. It says there in the verse we read that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Now, many people have the wrong idea. They think your, your mind is transformed. 
So as we read what God's word is, should our mind be transformed? Should our mind be changed? Should our mind become enlightened to God's way of thinking? Absolutely. Well, many people think that's enough. Just to have your mind enlightened to what God said is good enough. Friends, that's not what transformation is all about. Transformation is life change. It's where our lifestyle changes and we become more like Jesus. How many think that would be a good idea? Yeah, that's where we want to go. That's what transformation is all about. How does that happen? We hear what God says. You read what God says for yourself. You, we talk about it to ourselves and to our family. We, we mutter it over and over. We meditate on it so that it, it comes from our head down into our heart. Now, how do you know when it's in our heart? Well, the Bible teaches us that the Word of God should go into our hearts. That's the place of our affections, the place of our desires, where it changes our desires. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become what? Become new. So they become new, not as we think differently, but as it gets down into our heart where faith arises. And we can join our faith with what God says that it will be applied in my life personally. Point to yourself. That's it. To who? To me. To, to you personally where it changes our lifestyle, changes the way we live. Let me give you an example in the area of prayer. We talked about praying last week. How many remember the scripture verse we used? There were three verses, but it was started really easy. Pray without, come on, ceasing. Pray without ceasing, right? So we'll just stop there. Pray without ceasing. How many had your minds renewed to pray without ceasing? Do you know what that means? It means we know that it is God's desire that we would pray all the time, that we would carry an attitude of prayer, that we would we would not just, well, even when we're working, that we would be praying, we would be talking to God, we would be listening to God all the time. Do you enjoy doing that? Well, how do you know if you've been transformed by that word? You know when you catch yourself praying. When you're just going through life and you're busy working and then all of a sudden it dawns on you, I've just been praying. Then it's gone from your mind down into your heart where it's transformed the way you live on a day-to-day -day basis. When you're just out for a, a walk with your dog, you're praying. When you're out working, you're praying. When you're singing in the shower, you're praying. There's an attitude of prayer all the time. That's how we know when we have been transformed by the Word of God. And then it becomes effortless. It's not about thinking about praying. It's not about, oh, 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 I should be doing that. Now, you, you may take those moments to get there. But as we discipline ourselves to pray and, and to honor God and to understand prayer is not asking. It, it is asking, but it's not only asking. It's just talking to God and honoring Him. And, and sometimes it's worshiping God is part of prayer. And then it's listening to Him. Then we've been transformed by the Word of God. Now, there's a great example in Acts chapter 10. Would you turn in your Bible, please, to Acts chapter 10? And there's a good example about a man who was not even a follower of Jesus, but he had learned to pray. And he was praying without ceasing. And it affected his life and affected others around Acts chapter 10. Let me read the first uh, four verses here for you. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. So what does that mean? It means he loved God. He was not Jewish. He was Italian. Okay? He was a Gentile then. He was not a Jew. But he still had a love for God. Do you know people that have a love for God? They want to please God. I believe there, there are millions of people around the world that just have a love for God. They want to please God, but they've never found out about Jesus. Do you understand that that's possible? They're good people, good living people. And they influence the ones around as Cornelius did. Let me continue. 
One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming towards him. Cornelius, the angel said. Oh, Cornelius stared at him in terror. What would you do if an angel got your attention? You would be surprised as well. He said, what is it, sir? He asked the angel, and the angel replied, your prayers and your gifts to the poor or your alms have been received by God as an offering. Now, you caught that? He wasn't Jewish. He wasn't, uh, uh, it doesn't say he was a religious man going to worship in a certain place, but he had a desire to please God. He was a God-fearing man, and he influenced others. And what happened with his prayers? His prayers came up to God as a sweet offering to God. Was God impressed with his prayers? Absolutely. But it didn't stop with his prayers. It also went to his generosity as he blessed others. Now, now let me tell you something about Roman centurions. They were not known to be kind and generous people. They were brutal. They led a hundred armed soldiers into battle. They were strong. They were fortified. They did whatever was necessary. They were brutal in what they did. But even though he did his job well enough to be promoted to that centurion level over a hundred, he was still a God-fearing man that had a focus to help those around him. Sometimes people can have a job that makes them look tough but they can have a very soft heart inside. And so God saw his heart and said that he's, uh, his prayer and his generosity has been received by God as an offering. A prayer lifestyle will transform you. We discovered that last week, didn't we? Prayer will transform you. It's not just about changing your husband or your wife or your kids. It's not praying for situations only. It's relational with God. The same way, generosity will change your life, will transform you. Tell your neighbor, generosity will transform you. Go ahead. Generosity will transform you. Young people, generosity will transform you. Teenagers, young adults, transformation will come as you have a lifestyle of generosity. Let's, let's look a little bit further now. And see what happened with this. Let me give you the story. So as the angel spoke to him, he got the message. And immediately the angel continued to talk to him and said, Go send for Simon Peter. How many know who he is? One of the 12 disciples, right? He was in another city called Joppa, about 40 kilometers away. And he said, Now, get on your horse and ride. Get on your donkey and go. Whatever you need to go. He sent his servants to go down to get Simon Peter and ask him to come and speak to the centurion, Cornelius, and his whole household. So did he obey? Absolutely. If an angel speaks to you, what will you do? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Three bags full, sir. Whatever you ask, we're going to do it. Right? So that's what he did. Now, the interesting thing is that the story continues. You can read it at home. Again, Acts chapter 10. As they approached Joppa, Peter was on the rooftop of his host's house, Simon the Tanner, and he was up there and he was praying. And as he was praying, he got a vision himself of all of these uh, unclean animals, like the Bible in the Old Testament taught you, you can eat this type of animal, but you can't eat any pork and you can't eat any uh, shellfish, and, uh, bottom feeders, you can't eat those things. But the vision Peter had was all of these animals that were unclean were laid on a sheet and brought down and God said, eat. And Peter said, no, in his vision, I won't eat anything that's unclean. And God repeated it to him until he got the message. And God said, don't call unclean what I've said is clean. God was obviously getting a message through to him. And then as soon as Peter received that message, the Holy Spirit spoke to Peter. Aren't you glad the Holy Spirit can speak to us? And he said, Peter... There's people at the door waiting for you. Three men are at the door. Go downstairs. They're, they're asking you to come to another city to, to, along with them. Go with them. Wow. So he, Peter walked down the stairs. And just as he did, the door was being knocked. And he came and there they were. 
And so he invited them in and said, yes, we'll go. We'll go tomorrow. And the next day they went and they ended up there at Cornelius' house. Why was it so important? Because when Peter came, he said, God has spoken to me to come to your house. You know that a Jew should not be in your house. But God has said, don't call Gentiles unclean because I've called them clean. Peter's mind was renewed by God speaking to him. He thought the word of God and the message of God was only for the Jewish people. But he got it inside. His life was transformed from that day forward. He didn't go just to the Jews. He went to the Gentiles, and he went telling them about Jesus as well. Do you see what transformation is all about? His life changed in that moment. The more sensitive you get to God, the more you only have to hear things one time. And you agree with it and you join your faith and your life is transformed for God's future for you. Well, Peter <laughs> went there and, uh, and he started to preach to them. And, and let, let, me, let me go down a couple verses and, and then I'll move on. Uh, verse 44, if you're following. Verse 44 said, And as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message about Jesus. And, and the Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too, for they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. Listen, Peter didn't have an altar call. He didn't go around laying hands on anybody. He just spoke the word of God to people with a hungry heart. And they received it. They received the word of God into their mind, but into their heart. And it changed them in an instant of time. They started praying in other tongues that they'd never heard anybody ever do that before. The Holy Spirit came on them. And they started to prophesy and praise the living God. Their lives were transformed as they added their faith to what Peter was saying the message he was giving them. Aren't you glad that he wants to transform lives? And, and even the Jews that were there with him said, wow, this blows our mind. How can this be? And he said, well, what stops them now uh, to be water baptized? Seeing that the Holy Spirit has already filled them. Obviously, God's accepted them, so we should too. So they baptized them in water. What is the key here? God wants to transform lives everywhere. Amen? Amen. He wants to change us into His image. Last week, we focused on the aspect of prayer. Today, we want to focus on the aspect of generosity changing our lives so that we become more like Jesus. Is anyone more generous than Almighty God? For God so loved the world that He did what? He gave His only begotten Son that whoever would believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I mean, God gave His very best. Jesus gave his very best, and you, you're created in the image of God. Tell your neighbor, you're created in God's image. You're created. Young people, you're created in the image of God. He's a generous God. So therefore, the potential for generosity is there inside of every one of us. Okay, let's, let's move ahead now. And uh, if you want to take some notes, I'm going to go through a lot of scriptures today. So, so just write down the reference now. Because I want us to renew our mind in the area of generosity. How many would like to do that? Do you want to renew your mind in the area of generosity? Now, you know, so I'm, I'm not talking about giving to the church right now. I'm talking about having a heart of generosity. Generosity is not taking money out of your pocket and putting it in somebody else. It's an attitude that I want to give. I want to add value to others. I will do whatever I can to add value to others. It could be with your time. It could be with the talents God has given you. Or it could be with the treasure God puts in your hand. So, so you ready to learn? Point number one is this. God owns everything. Tell your neighbor. Isn't that profound? God owns how much? God owns everything. What does that mean? Does that mean God owns what you have in your hand? So he, he allows us to have possession of things. But God owns 
everything. Wow. So, so let me give you a scripture verse. Psalm 24, verse number 1, says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So that means God owns everything, including you. God owns you, Amanda. We are God's. We belong to Him. Who takes our breath from us? Who gives us breath? Only God. So God owns everything. He, so consequently, we want to have, let Him have the rulership over what He owns. God owns everything. In the Old Testament, the book of Haggai, you don't have to find it right now, just write it down. If you want to make it short, just put Hag. 2 verse 8. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord God Almighty. But yet I have stuff in my hands. How many, how many have things that you own? Yeah, many own houses and cars and all that stuff. But guess what? God owns everything. So if we try to own it and God tries to own it, we could have a problem there. So when we recognize that God owns everything, how does this work? Well, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18 says, Remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. He doesn't just drop dollar bills off the trees outside into our hands. He gives us the abilities. He gives us the, the strength and the faith to be able to gain the resources that we have. God gives us everything because He owns everything. So when you get a big paycheck, what do you do? Praise the Lord. Thank Him for everything that comes into your hand. When someone gives you a gift, what do you do? Do you say thank you? Yes, yeah, say thank you to them. Say thank you to God because He owns everything. So if He owns everything, why does He put possessions in our hands? Because we are created in His image. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We are His partners on earth. He's delegated authority over the things that He's placed in our hands. In fact, if God owns everything, what are we? We are God's money managers. We are the managers of what He's put in our possession. Tell your neighbor, you are a money manager. Yeah, do you have money? Praise God. Tony, do you have money? Come show me. No, never mind. You are God's money manager. When we get this idea, it becomes more clear in our mind. Remember, the renewing of our mind is what transforms us, but it has to get down into the area of faith where we join our heart together with God and we live it out on a day-to-day -day basis. So then, if God makes you His money manager, what does the Bible say about that? Let me give you an example. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2 says, Now it is required that those who have been giving a trust must prove faithful. So what kind of money managers is God looking for? Faithful ones. We said that word about a hundred times in our singing today about being faithful. And so God trusts us, trusts you to be faithful. And He allows you to have resources, His resources, come into your hand. Romans uh, 14 verse 10 says, For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Maybe you remember in Matthew chapter 25 where, where God gave, uh, 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 the, the master gave one talent to one and two to another and five to another person. How many remember that? And then he came back to account for it. And he said, all right, what have you done with what I put in your hands? And the ones who'd been faithful, whether it was with two or whether it was with five, had the exact same word spoken into them. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little, and so now he's going to bless them with much. So with God, what does he want us to do? To be faithful with what he has put in our hands so that he can bless us with, with even more responsibility, God will honor faithfulness. Praise God. We won't tell you what happened to the guy with one. You can read it in Matthew chapter 25. Point number two is this. Your heart always goes where you put God's money. Did you catch that? Your heart always moves to where you put God's money. 
Who owns everything? God does. So whose money is it that we spend? God's money, right? So then our heart moves to where we put God's money. Hallelujah. It's good to clarify that, isn't it? And so let me read a verse out of Matthew chapter 6. And this is our memory verse for today, found in verse number 21. Uh, turn there so you can underline it. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. Talks, that whole section talks. Let me read from verse 19. He says, do, d Jesus is speaking, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. How many have found out that when you have savings and when, when you store up more than you need, maybe it's things, they tend to get rusty. They tend to wither away. How many discovered that? One, two, three. Oh, a few of you have discovered that. Is the Bible true? The Bible's true. Does that mean we spend every cent we get as soon as we get it? No, it doesn't say that. It's talking about laying up treasures on earth. Earth is not our focus. Let me finish the reading the verse there. But store up for yourself treasures in where? In heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. And then verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Say it with me. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. One more time. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Which moves first? Where your treasure goes, your heart follows. Is, is that true? So how many of you remember when you, you first met the love of your life? Four? Oh, oh, there's more. Okay, good. You better if you're sitting close to them. And then what did you want to do? Did you want to bless them? Did you want to spend time together? Did you want to buy Maria uh, uh, some food to eat, have lunch with her and stuff like that? Praise God. Why was that? Your heart started to go there. So you put your treasure there. And your heart follows. You put your treasure there and our heart follows. What is God trying to teach us? Not just to be led by, by, by any desire that comes out because the media all around us tries to put things in front of us that make them look good so that we will run after and put our money there. But we're to be led by the Spirit of God so that when the Holy Spirit points us in a certain area... We want to be generous in that area. We want to bless someone because we care for them. We love them. Does that happen for you? If it doesn't, repent. What comes first? Where the treasure goes, the heart follows. So I've discovered this is a very important key. As a good steward, I can make godly decisions on where I put my finances. God gives me the ability to do that. You too. And then He will lead us by the Holy Spirit. But if He tells us, give towards a certain project, what am I supposed to do? Cast down that imagination in the name of Jesus. Because I don't have enough money in my pocket yet. No. If we give out of what we do have, our heart will move in that direction. Our desires will go in the direction God wants to go. Let me use this building as an example. We want to reach more people so that they can belong to the kingdom of God. Is that right? So we're, we're growing that, that, we can, that others may belong. It's not just for us. We would have been okay a little tight in there, but we could have run multiple services even more than the, the two we had, and it would have been okay. But, but for others to come, we, we love them. So what do we do? We put our resources. We spent $3.5 million to reach out and touch others. So then what should happen now? Now our heart wants to travel to bring others into this place. That's why we're doing Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flame, to bring many people in. That's why we, we challenge you to be able to bring an offering into to Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flame, to pay for it ahead of time so that why our heart, our treasure goes there first and our heart will follow. 
Amen? This is having our mind renewed because our natural mind doesn't want to do that. Our natural mind wants to hold on to everything that comes into our possession. And when it leaves, it squeaks out of our hand. That's what our natural man wants to do. But God wants to renew our minds so that we can do things His way. Let, let me just clarify this a little bit. Let me give you some factors to consider here. Heaven is our home, not this earth. Is that true? The Bible clearly says it. Philippians chapter 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven. In Psalm 90, it says the length of our days is 70 or 80 if we have strength but they quickly pass away. So heaven is our home. So we should invest in heaven, not just on what happens here on earth in such a short period of time. And then secondly, God blesses good stewardship. So if we want God's favor on our life, then we must be good stewards. We must do things God's way and listen to the Holy Spirit so that we can do what God says. Do you know God puts things in our hands on purpose so that we can enjoy them? But once we start to enjoy them, we think they're ours. And then he says, I want you to give that car to this person. What would you do if God spoke to you about that? I see you bowing your heads humbly, <laughs> praying and casting down those imaginations. Lord, don't speak to me. When we honor God, then we say, Lord, Everything belongs to you. Therefore, I will with faith in my heart and fear mixed with it a little bit. With faith in my heart, I will do what you tell me to do. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the privilege. And when you do that, you watch what happens. Watch how God blesses. I remember we had dear friends that were missionaries down in, in uh, the West Indies for many years. And they'd given away everything that they had to go down there. They, to, you know, they just were willing, they, they had a heart of generosity. When they were there, they were helping the people, doing all that they could. And then they moved back to Canada in the wintertime. And uh, I, I still remember uh, Daisy <laughs> saying, uh, God is so good, He owns everything. When we came back to Canada, He gave us a house. He gave me a fur coat. In fact, he gave how many fur coats? Three fur coats so that I could bless others with them. God wants us to understand resources from heaven are never limited except by our actions. And so when our heart is transformed, our lifestyle changes. When our life changes, then we want to be generous. We want to do what we can do. But you listen to the Holy Spirit. Don't go give everything away because it's a good idea. Listen to the Holy Spirit. And then listen to this one. Giving is the only antidote for materialism. What is materialism? It's the materialism is the power of the day. It's get all you can. Get more, get more, get more. Because children are raised up in homes that have been blessed, when they get their new house, what kind of house do they want? The same kind that their parents are living in after 20 or 30 or 40 years of marriage. They should have the same thing. They should drive a better car than their parents. That's often the mindset. Is that not the mindset? And then it's easy to get. In fact, you don't have to pay until 2016 for this furniture. You can have it now. Have instant gratification now. You don't have to worry about paying. No interest or anything. Is that not the day we're living in? That's a day of materialism. The only antidote for materialism is generosity. Giving. Whoever loves money never has enough money. Ecclesiastes 5. At first Timothy 6, 9, and 10 says this, People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith 
and pierce themselves with many griefs. So I'm not talking about money today. I'm talking about generosity. I'm talking about the quality of the heart that I want to bless others. I desire to honor God, to listen to His voice and do what He says. Is that your desire? See, that's what God has for every one of us. Okay, let me, let me take it to point number three. Point number three is this. God prospers you not to raise your standard of living, but to raise your standard of giving. Can I say it one more time? I see some of you writing it down. Bro God prospers you not to raise your standard of living, but to raise your standard of giving. How many have heard uh, of a man named John Wesley? Have you ever heard of John Wesley? Some of you have. He was a wonderful man of God, lived hundreds of years ago now, uh, two, two and a half centuries ago. But he, he ended up being a strong follower of God, and God blessed him with many insights. And, and him and his brother really transformed England at, at that time to become a God-fearing nation. And he started off, and, and he, was, he was earning 28 pounds a year, which at that time as a university professor was a lot of money. So he gave a tenth of that, and he gave out to others. He looked for widows and orphans. Okay? And then what happened? The next year, his income increased dramatically. What did he do? He lived on the same 28 pounds he'd lived on the previous year. He lived, and he gave the rest away. And then after, I think it was after four years, his income had more than quadrupled. And his lifestyle had gone from 28 pounds to 30 pounds a year. But his giving was now off the charts. And all through his life, he continued to live that way. He lived in a modest fashion for his day. He had all he needed. And he invested the others out into God's work and into people around him that had need. What do you think God would say to a person like that? Well done, good and faithful servant. So what's point number three? God prospers you not to raise your standard of living, but to raise your standard of giving. Malachi chapter 3.10 says this, Test me in this, says the Lord God Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven, pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. God wants to pour out His blessing. He wants to do it. Now, if you read the Scripture and you read the, verse, the, the verses are, uh, preceding it and the beginning of this verse, it says, bring in all the tithe into the storehouse, right? So He's talking about as we do our part, as we obey God, listen to the Holy Spirit, do what He says, bring in a tenth and then bring in offerings. Then God wants to open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing on you. Why? Because when we do what God said with generosity of heart, He knows He can trust us as good and faithful servants to utilize the wealth He puts in our hands to bless others as He gives us direction. Amen? So God does not bless you to increase your what? Standard of living, but to increase your standard of giving. Praise God. We should almost shout and yell and, and be happy about that one. All right. Let, let, me, uh, let me finish up this section now. In fact, uh, in 2 Corinthians, write this down. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 7. It says this. But just as you excel in everything, as you excel in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness and in your love for us, the verse finishes this way, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Did you catch that? Excel, use your faith in every area, including in the area of generosity. I don't quote a lot of people outside the Bible, but Winston Churchill said this. <laughs> I like it. You make a living by what you get. You make a life by what you give. I'll say it one more time. You make a living by what you get. You make a life by what you give. Isn't that great? 
Okay, one more scripture to write down, and then I want to switch direction just a little bit. In Isaiah 32 and verse 8, it says this, A generous man devises generous things, and by generosity he shall stand. One more time. A generous man devises generous things, and by generosity he shall stand. Praise God. Ruel, could you help me please? And so how does this work? How does this work in the church? Is it, is it only for church? You know, so I haven't talked about giving offerings or anything like that. But I believe we, we need to address how this works for those who are followers of Jesus. God wants us to be what? Generous. To be generous. Can you be generous outside in the workplace? Yes. yes, you can. Can you be generous in helping others? Yes, you can. You can be generous with your time. You can be generous with the, the talent God has given you. We have auto mechanics here. You can be generous by fixing somebody's car, by blessing them, by helping them out. Is that true? There's many ways we can be generous. Generosity is a quality of the heart that God wants for us. Praise God. Are we going to move it over just a little bit more? I want over that just a little bit more, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. And so we can be generous that way. But in the church world, people sometimes get the wrong concept about what God is really looking for. I've been in the church world. I've been born again now for more than 45 years. And so I've been in many different places at many different times. And I found that there's different ways to express generosity often. Help me out, Ruel, with this one. When you first come to church... What kind of giver are you? How many people do you know? Well, you don't know them. Let's talk about you. Before your life was changed, how many of you were non-givers? I was a non-giver. In fact, when I first came to church, I was a non-giver. And then I started to, to intentionally carry money. First of all, I intentionally didn't have money in my pocket. When I went to church, how many can identify? So I would make sure my wallet was empty before I came to church. And then I made sure I had $5 in it so that I could tip God. Don't just look straight ahead. I'm not talking about you. But then God starts to work in our hearts. Is that right? And then we want to do something for God. So we want to become what, what I am calling here an initial giver. So an initial giver is one who intentionally comes prepared to give. They receive an offering envelope like we put in the folder. Receive an offering envelope. They put their name on the offering envelope and how much they're giving. And they do it intentionally. Why would you use an offering envelope? Because in Canada, we have the privilege of receiving an income tax receipt probably next week or the week after. You'll get yours. And then we use it, and God gives us money back. Is that true? Because of our charitable giving. And so what I found is initial givers are ones who, who God has softened their hearts, and they've decided they wish they, they, it's all right for them that others know that they're committed to give to God. They're not trying to hide it. Now, there's different types of giving. So if I give to a person that, that is poor, I don't tell the world about that. But when I want to give to God, it's all right for others to know that because that can encourage them to be givers as well. And so then this initial giver writes it on the offering envelope and then away they go. Some people in our church here, well, we, we'll go on, we won't talk about that right now. All right. Then there's another step of giving that I'll climb up this ladder. This is a ladder of generosity, all right? Climb up our generosity ladder. What's this one say? A proportional giver. What does it mean to be a proportional giver? It means you bring in a percentage of what you've earned that week. Now, we some get paid by the month, some by the biweekly, some by the, the week. I understand that. Some get, may get paid every day. But when we come and worship, each time we come to worship, you can figure out if you get paid by the month divided by 4.3 or by 4 if you want. And then you bring in a portion of that. The portion will be determined by your faith. Now, how much faith does it take 
to be a non-giver. Come on. Very, no faith whatsoever. How about to be an initial giver? It takes a little bit of faith to be an initial giver. Now, how about to be a proportional giver? Does it take more faith? Yes, so you know you're growing in God. Your faith is growing as you become a proportional giver. Now, we, everybody has a different idea, depending on their faith, what that percentage should be. What does God say it should be? God says it should be 10%. Who is smarter, you or God? Who owns everything? God owns everything. You are a money manager of God. God said, in order for your life to go the very best, give 10%. In fact, he said, I own that 10%. He said, just present it to me. I'll give you all the money, but you present 10. Does that show your faith? It only shows your faith, friends, if it's your first 10. Let me climb back down the ladder. People don't give because sometimes their heart is hard. They think God or the church wants something from them. Then God starts to soften their heart. But they recognize that at the end of the month, Many months, there's more month than money. So therefore, I only have a little, so I'll give out of my little. When you give your last, it will always be little. But God says, no, give your first fruits to God, and your barns will be filled. Your vats will be overflowing in Proverbs. So when we are proportional givers, we've already decided ahead of time what we're going to do. So now we're giving in faith. I challenge you, give in faith. Be a proportional giver. Give a tenth and watch God prove himself by opening the windows of heaven to bless you, to put more in your hands so that you can give more to him and be generous with others as well. It's not just about money coming into the church. It's about having our life transformed by the living God. Did y'all catch that? So I'm not trying to get your money. I'm trying to have you blessed. It comes through having your life transformed. Not just knowing it's the right thing to do. Many are caught there. But actually as a lifestyle, doing it every week. So is this as far as we can go? No, it's not. If we have faith now, if you have more faith, you can go from, from a non-giver to an initial giver up to a a, uh, a, what's the next one? This one takes us all the way up to becoming a sacrificial giver. Who do you know from the Bible is a sacrificial giver? God is a sacrificial giver. Jesus was a sacrificial giver. Many of the Old Testament leaders were sacrificial givers. They gave beyond what was normal. And then even Barnabas was a sacrificial giver. He sold a property, and he brought in how much? He brought in everything. Why do you think that's in the Bible? To show us that there can be sacrificial givers, and that God honors that. And then we have Ananias and Sapphira, the next chapter. And they wanted to pretend they were sacrificial givers when they were someplace else down the generosity ladder. They got themselves in big trouble. So I'm not asking you to announce anything. I want you to determine where is your faith. Is your faith growing? Are you the same place where you were last year? Is your life transformed in the area of generosity? If it is, God can trust you with much, much more than you've ever had before. God wants us to have people in, in this category. Now, now, let me tell you reality. Reality is... This is a generosity ladder. In Brownlee Christian Fellowship, we have people on every rung of this ladder. Are you excited about that? I'm excited about it because some may just come in. They, they just talked to Jesus. They just, for the first time, learned about Jesus and said, I want to, I want to be an initial giver. I came in this way, but I, I want to go to there. And then others maybe, maybe have been there, but your faith is growing. And, and now I, I've given you so many scriptures so that you can think about them this week. 
so you can chew on them and say God owns everything. And, and yet he has made me his money manager. Wow. What will I do? Will I be a, a faithful steward? This is where being a faithful steward comes in. Yeah, take out your phone. Take a picture of it if you want, if it'll help you at home. And this, this is where I want to live. And, and live there. Be a proportional giver. Give. Bring in your tenth. God will bless you. You notice we don't condemn anybody. Wherever you are is where you are. I've had single moms that were living off of welfare that caught on to it. Their lives were transformed. They went from, from here to here to went up to here and God opened the windows of heaven and blessed them in such a way that, well, beyond what you can imagine. They've told me the, the stories, the testimonies. So when your life is transformed, God changes us by His power. Lift your hands up to God now, Father. We worship you, Father. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your loving kindness to us. We thank you, Lord, that you've been helping us today to have our mind renewed by the Word of God in the area of generosity. Lord, help us. You can talk to God if you want. Lord, help me to become more generous. Help me, Lord, to understand. But Lord, help it to go down into my heart where generosity becomes a day-by-day -day activity in my life, where I live to give. I, I look forward to opportunities to be able to be a blessing to others. Lord, where I'm faithful in what is little so that you can bless me with what is much. Lord, help me to have my mind, my heart, my life renewed in the area of of generosity in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, interesting. Uh, earlier this month, we usually give a, an update on the building. And so let me, let me give it to you. Just, uh, I'll just take a few seconds. In the month of December, we received 26955 for the building fund. Isn't that good? Praise God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And we, for the total of 2013 alone, we received $251,902. Isn't that good? Praise the Lord. Now, out of that, some were very sacrificial. Some gave systematically, and, and some gave nothing towards that particular area. So I want you to listen to God on these areas, please. When we moved into this building, we started to pay the mortgage on the building. What that means is every week, our expenses went up at least $5,000 a week. And so I, I, I'm not here to push that to you because God owns everything. He is our source of supply. But the way that we make that payment is that each one of us bring in our portion, our tenth. And as we bring in a tenth, there's no problem at all. But we, we're not quite there yet. So I want to challenge you in this area. And then we talked about Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames. I, I spoke and said, all right, it's going to cost about $5,000 to go ahead with this. We've received just over half that now, just over $2,500. And so I would like to challenge you today and now, let's receive the rest of that so that we can bless others. Where your treasure is, your heart will go as well. Ushers, could you please give offering envelopes? Now, if you don't want to give today, feel no compulsion. Could I have one, David, please? David? Thank you, Jesus. No compulsion, but this is an opportunity. Whenever faith is spoken, we want to have an opportunity to act on that faith. We've spoken about generosity today, so we have the opportunity to act on that generosity. And so I believe that God wants to use you to bless others, Today, many of you have tickets that are sitting on your dresser. How do you get them out? Let's give towards that outreach event, toward the hearts of men and women, and then let's move towards them as well. Let our heart follow our giving. If, if you want to give towards building, perhaps you didn't give towards the building this month and you'd like to, then just mark it under building, 
or the other one you can put under other. If you want to, if God spoke to your heart and you need to give tithes today, it's all right. You can do that. We want to honor God in the area of generosity. Now, I want to tell you something very, very critical. Throughout this week, God is going to give you opportunities to be a blessing to others. How many want that opportunity? God's going to give you opportunities because it's not about having our mind renewed. It's about having our life renewed. Okay? Our mind is renewed by the Word of God, but our life is renewed as faith is mixed with it. That is changed. So on the back of the connection card, it says, I will look for ways to be generous. Check that off. I will discuss with my family how we as a family can climb the generosity ladder. All of those that have teenagers, talk about it because it's not just adults. I had a young person speak to me this week that said they heard at the movement service they were challenged that God wants people to be generous. They heard a story about how God blesses that. And they went out for coffee after the, the movement service and, and decided that they would bless the person with them, paid for their, their goodies. And when they came home, there was money sitting on their bed waiting for them that was a total surprise. So God reinforced the message that you gave last week, guys. Well done. So God is at work. He's doing it. And He's helping us. Maybe you're here today and you say, wow, this is, this is crazy. Uh, I've never, I've never thought about this. Perhaps, perhaps you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. All it takes is confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believing in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, and you shall be saved. All he's looking for you to do is pray a simple prayer. Bow your head. Let me pray. If you want, you can follow with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I surrender my whole life to you. I believe Jesus died for me. Thank you, Jesus. I surrender my life to you. I will live to serve you all my days. Help me. Live through me, please. Amen. Back of your connection card. I know you're finished with offering, but grab your connection card. Look at the back side. On the right side, it says, I'm interested in accepting Jesus as Lord or rededicating my life or water baptism, or, or maybe some of you want to be altar workers here at Heaven's Gates, Hell's Fangs. We need many. We, we've only got about half as many as we need. So check that off if you want to be part of that. And then we're going to put it in outside. If you've decided which life group you want to be part of, make sure you mark it there as well. Thank you, Father. Can we lift our offering up to the Lord and pray? Say, Father, receive this gift, I pray. Multiply it, multiply its effectiveness, we ask. Bless others through it, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Praise God. Well, God is good. Ushers, would you serve us, please? Thank you so much. Thank you, Jesus. And I'm so impressed with the many people here that, that just want to give. Many are, are older. They've lived their full life. Their income has gone down significantly, but they still want to be faithful to give proportionally to God. Thank you. I celebrate you. I celebrate you. Well done. Well done. It's not about how much you have or how much you earn. Generosity is a heart thing. Those of you watching over the internet, thank you for watching today. We challenge you as well. If you ever want to give towards BCF Church, right up top it says giving. You can give online and participate. But generosity is more than giving to a church. Generosity is something we carry with us all week long to be a blessing to others. Let's stand on our feet. I want to pray for you one last time. The giving kiosk are open outside if that's your choice. Remember to get your children. When you do so, please thank the workers for their kindness. Sign up for the connection cards or for Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames tickets and also for the uh, kissing breakups goodbye. Lift your hands up to heaven one last time. Father, thank you for each and every one here. Go with us. Strengthen us. 
Empower us all week long. Help us to live to please you every single day. Let your angels be around about us, keeping us safe and well, healthy and whole. Lord, those that may be sick in body, let them be revitalized and strengthened, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless you. Sing this song as you go today.